Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Rutondo Tomoli, self-proclaimed Koloro Wavenda. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoy this video. And let's get straight into the video. So today's case was so confusing. Like, I was confused. But I still felt like it was a case that needed to be out there and needed to be known by people. So today's case is about a woman by the name of Tandiwe Betty Katani. So Tandiwe Betty Katani grew up in the Eastern Cape and she was one of 10 siblings. Her mother was married to her father and they had five kids together and then they got divorced and then she married another man and then they had another five kids together. So they didn't think of each other as step siblings. They pretty much just all saw each other as brother and sister. And that was how they grew up. So when Betty became old enough, she decided that she wanted to go to Gauteng for a better life for herself and her family, just like a lot of other South Africans do. So Betty Katani was able to find herself a job in a restaurant, a Thai restaurant that went by the name of Crank. She was able to learn how to cook these different delicacies because like Thai food and South African food is very, very different from each other. And she grew up in a hometown, so she wasn't even like thinking about Thai food, but she was actually able to learn it very, very fast. And she did so well that she was able to earn a head chef position. Her children lived with her mother in Queenstown while she would send money every single month to them to help with um, anything they needed from bills to food and everything. This was a really big help because like a monthly salary is such a big thing and being able to send money monthly to your family and help them is really good. So even though she wasn't earning that much money from cranks, she was still able to send money and also maintain herself living in Johannesburg at the time. While working in this restaurant, Cranks, she was very highly regarded by the owner of this restaurant called Eric Neeterson Lemix, who was also known as Mad Dog. So Eric had a daughter who was staying in Australia and she had moved to South Africa in Johannesburg in the year 1999. This was when she started to take more control of the business for her father, probably. And she was more in charge of the business and became more of the boss than her father was. Money started to go missing during this time. The atmosphere of the restaurant started to become very uncomfortable and hostile because they were trying to find out who was stealing this money. And sadly, Tandiwe became one of the main focuses and they really focused on her believing that she was the one who was stealing this money. On the last morning that she was seen alive in May of 1999, she was where she was on her way to work in the morning and no one has seen her. No one had seen her since that morning. So Monique, the daughter of Eric, while she was in charge, this was when she decided that she wanted to do something about who these people were that were stealing this money from her family business. At the time, she was seeing a man by the name of Carrington Layton. Carrington Layton was known for his business that he had with this firm where he pretty much ran the firm where they did a lot of private investigations, debt collections, pretty much everything that they needed to do to make money that needed extra hands so he ran with a few friends that he used from time to time to help him deal with any situation that he had in the firm or whatever help that he needed in march of 2012 a family while they were cleaning out their home and then they removed a rug and a tile from the ground they found a letter and the beginning of this letter stated that if you are reading this, I am dead. This was the letter that opened all their eyes into the disappearance of Tandiwe Betty Katani. So in this letter, it was stated that a few people were involved in her disappearance and murder. 
So the letter states that in 1999, when they were searching for the person who had stolen the money, Monique and Carrington had actually kidnapped Tadiwe and a few other staff members, but they had released the other staff members. They actually kidnapped Tandiwe three times before the final time that led to her murder. In these times, they would kidnap her and take her to, her, to a hotel room and interrogate her. It is said that she was being interrogated for hours and hours on end to try and find out if she had taken this money. One of Carrington's friends said that while he was at home one day, he received a call in the middle of the night from Carrington. On this call, Carrington told him to meet him at a certain location. So he immediately picked up everything he needed and he went to this location. When he got there, he found Carrington standing on the side of the road, holding a woman up. This woman, not known at the time, was actually Betty Katani. When he got out of the car, Carrington came and said, hold her up. As he was holding her up, he says that Carrington, he repeatedly stabbed the woman in the face and the upper body area. He said that after this had happened, they left her body there and they got into their cars and drove away. After a few weeks, they received a call and in this call, they said that they found out that Betty had actually was able to make it to a hospital and was now in a coma fighting brain damage. They all started to freak out and it is claimed, we don't know if it's true because it's one witness statement, not everyone's story. The witness says that him and Carrington and another one of their friends dressed up as doctors and went to the hospital where Betty was being taken care of and trying to recover from her injuries. They said when they got there dressed as doctors and nurses, they kidnapped her again from the hospital. They took her and they put her in the back of a van and they drove away. After they kidnapped her, they left her in the van. And this is when she actually passed away because now she didn't have the care that she had in the hospital. So while they were trying to decide what they were going to do with the body, the first place that they tried to bury her, the ground was too hard. So they were unable to actually dig a grave. So they took her body and they went to Conway Brown's residence. And there they went behind the garage and they were able to actually dig into the gr into the ground brown brown claims that monique was the one who came up with the idea of putting her body inside a block of cement so they put her body in a block of cement and then they buried her under the ground in under the garage behind the garage brown says that after this had happened he planted flowers on top and he maintained these flowers for as long as he stayed there he said that this was his sign of showing respect and trying to at least put, make where they buried her body pretty. As the years went by, this was when they started to believe that, okay, they got away with this murder. In 2000, Monique actually moved away and she ended up after a few years back in Australia with no contact with any of the people that she left behind in South Africa. Mr. Brown said that he started to get very nervous and very worried about the body and he one day went and dug it up and broke the cement with a hammer. He found that all that was left was Betty's bones and an oil-like, water-like substance inside. He says that they took Betty's bones they broke her skull into pieces and then they took all her bigger bones and they threw them in a nearby river. All this time, Betty's children and her family had no idea where she was and why the payments and why the money and the calls just stopped coming in 1999. 
and it was only found in 2012 what had actually happened to her all they want is justice to be found these people pretty much was so close to getting away with murder monique is staying in australia and they still trying to find a way to extradite her and bring her back to south africa so that she can also pay for her crimes while brown was actually imprisoned and then he decided to turn state witness and was sentenced to five years in a home-like jail so this case was really confusing because there is a lot of holes in the story as you can hear there's a lot of unanswered questions and a lot of confusion but i still wanted to get it out there that justice was still served even though it took so many years but no one can get away with murder as much as you think that you have gotten away with something it will come back to bite you i'm sorry for the confusion if you guys were confused i tried to make it as simple as possible this case because it had a lot of ups and downs and a lot of because it was mostly witnesses and people probably were trying to protect themselves and also implicate other people without implicating themselves. So there's a lot of the story that is missing. But I hope you enjoyed this video and please like, subscribe and comment down below what you thought and what are your thoughts about this? How after 12 years, finally, they were able to find what actually happened to Betty Katani and her fine and her family was actually able to finally get closure. But yeah, that is the case. Very confusing. I was also confused. But thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.